Good evening, everybody. We are doing a sort of special celebration today for um, this extraordinary book, uh, Blood Relations, a book that changed my life, literally, and I'll tell you about that later. Um, and it's 30 years old this year from publication, um, a classic text which uh, Chris Knight authored. And he's going to give us some snippets from it, um, tell us something about you know, how it got there, how, how he um, wrote it, and then various uh, members of the panel, so one of whom is downstairs letting people on the door, and I hope Ian's going to come up soon, um, Jerome, who's online with us on Zoom, um, and uh, possibly also Mark Jamison, maybe uh, joining later and myself, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what blood relations, why it mattered so much, um, and then open to discussion and questions. So I hope that'll be an um, interesting evening. So let's hand over to Chris. You um, do that, and I'll try and admit people. Okay, so um, anthropology um, asks just one question, but it's a very big one. What does it mean to be human? And we anthropologists address that question in different ways, of course. Um, and one of them is to ask what it might mean to be uh, almost human in the sense of a chimpanzee, a bonobo, a gorilla, a, a close relative of ours, uh, very intelligent creatures, of course, but maybe not exactly human. And that uh, primatology is a branch within biological anthropology. We also ask what it might mean to be an ancestral uh, human or uh, Homo habilis, uh, a Neanderthal. Uh, so we look not just across different species closely related to us, but we, we also look in, into the past. And of course, the classic um, social anthropological perspective is to look at all the different ways around the world that there are of being human. So many different ways which teach us that the particular way we do things in this uh, culture, this particular way isn't the only and necessary uh, way. So last week, um, I gave a talk um, on what we can learn from chimpanzees. Uh, and of course, the familiar chimpanzees um, are extremely uh, instructive. And very often, um, the fact that uh, common chimps are very competitive, really very male dominated, uh, very defensive of their territorial boundaries and they engage in warfare um, does lead has led many people to think well uh, we humans are great apes in particular we're chimps and although you radicals feminists environmentalists socialists whatever you happen to be anarchists you might want to uh, make change the world there's one thing you can't change um, any more than you can change the number of fingers uh, you have on each hand and that thing is human nature. Uh, and possibly the most authoritative primatologist these days is Richard Wrangham, who studied under Jane Goodall, studied common chimps, and he makes exactly this point, that we are chimpanzees, and the fact that we're competitive and male-dominated and, and practice warfare is because um, we're chimpanzees. So last week I dwelt on the fact that not all chimpanzees are anything like common chimps, that about a million years ago, as far as we can work out, a particular small, probably small population of chimps crossed to the south side of the Congo River and found abundant resources, enabling the females of the, among these chimpanzees to forage together, form coalitions, form alliances with each other. And lo and behold, <laughs> the bonobos are now known to be just as closely related to us as common chimps, in some ways, you know, behaviorally probably more like us in, in, in many ways and they are matriarchal. Um, and the reason they're matriarchal isn't because the, the female bonobos are stronger, bigger than the males, it's because they're, act they're actually smaller, it's because they form alliances. And as a result of the fact that they form alliances more powerfully through their GG rubbing, their, their lesbian bonding, they form alliances more powerful than the alliances between males. Um, they are described by primatologists as matriarchal. Um, we had a discussion and we all agreed here, and we've long agreed this, that you can't really use either kind of chimp as a kind of stand-in for early humans. They're very interesting. We are great apes like they are, 
But what the, what the bonobo um, example proves is that the, the, the political dynamics, the social dynamics of chimps, as the dynamics of ourselves, uh, are not genetically determined. They're not genetically fixed. What is fixed, what genes do, they determine your, your physiology, your body, uh, your anatomy, and so on. And of course, that, those, those things act as a constraint on what you can do. I mean, we, you know, we don't have wings, we can't fly, we have two legs, we tend to walk, <laughs> all those things. But with that gives you a huge range of variability. Um, and so last week, as I was saying, the fact that when females um, of, um, among close relatives of ours have environmental conditions, enabling them to get together and form alliances, they really turn the world upside down. Everything we thought we knew about our closest chimpanzee relatives turns out to be completely wrong. The bonobos, as I say, just as closely related to us, uh, largely female dominated, absolutely no record of infanticide, quite astonishingly, because infanticide is a very severe problem for common chimps. Uh, and uh, no, no record, as far as I'm aware, of, of bonobos in the wild, uh, of uh, warfare, anything remotely like um, warfare, quite the opposite. When two different groups of bonobos get together, the females ally with the, quote, enemy females in order to uh, resist their own males in order to have sex with the other. <laughs> it's, it's about as far removed from male on male warfare as you can possibly get. And that just opens their eyes to the fact that things are so variable. Right, I'm not going to give a lecture this evening uh, on my book, um, Blood Relations, but uh, in a nutshell, the, the way people talk about my basic theory of human origins is Chris Knight has got the sex strike theory. He believes there was a sex strike. Um, uh, that is sort of true, <laughs> uh, but I want to explain what I mean by that. And I'm not really going to give a lecture. What I'm going to give is a few sort of notes building on last week's talk and read out a myth and read out a passage from the end of um, the book to give you some sort of, sort of some idea of the range of things which um, the book um, covers. So um, one of the critical things I, I wanted to explain in my book is the fact that we humans have formal kinship structures. We have quite elaborate structures of kinship and all structures of kinship distinguish, for example, sister from wife sister you don't have sex with, wife you do. A wife, the word wife is rather misleading because that isn't at all the, con the concept that hunter-gatherers have. Most, hun certainly egalitarian hunter-gatherers have a thing called bride service where a man never uh, gains conjugal rights in his bride, his sexual partner. He has to earn his keep. He has to be generous, modest. He has to go hunting and bring back the meat. And he has to do that in a modest way, not boasting about it. And his, 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 his sexual partner will at least in the early years of the relationship, will be living with her mum, therefore probably living with her sisters. The brothers will be around quite a bit. And um, basically, if the young man doesn't behave, if he doesn't prove himself a useful son-in-law or, 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 or husband, visiting husband, um, then he's out on his neck. So he has, to, and, he, and he, he will never have what the kind of, what we imagine is the conjugal rights. This, this woman is my wife. She said yes to me when we got married, therefore she's going to give me sex. That never happens. And women absolutely have uh, the right, continuously um, ex exerted, uh, to refuse sex. I mean, without that, of course, you haven't got any freedom uh, at all. Um, so in a way, bride service is what I'm talking about. I mean, the, as I say, the fundamental economic institution of at least egalitarian hunter-gatherers and all hunter-gatherers who don't practice storage tend to be egalitarian and tend also to be gender egalitarian, the fundamental economic institution, you can say it's sharing, it's gift giving, but underpinning that gift giving is this institution known as bride service. So a man cannot go hunting and accumulate wealth. Everything he earns, everything he produces, all the meat he gathers immediately has to be surrendered to his bride and her relatives, to his in-laws. Um, and of course, she, of course the, the, the woman herself has the right to say no, um, it's not enough. You're not doing. You're not behaving. You're, you're being lazy. You're being boastful. Whatever. You're being irritated. Whatever. And so, can, can you see what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say, sex strike is kind of involved in that. It, 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 I'm not thinking of a big picket line. That everyone's suddenly going on strike. In this particular instance, I'm saying it's just a normal part of life. That women can say yes to sex and no right through their relationship. There never comes a time when you have a wedding and you said yes, and that's till death do you part. That is a, a different kind of institution which we're very familiar with, 
at least from our recent uh, past, not, maybe it's not quite so much these days, um, but it's certainly not part of like, if you like, human nature. And so, my, my, as I was saying, human kinship structures have these categories. A sister is different from a wife. Your mother-in-law is different from your mother. Actually, hunter-gatherer kinship systems, or at least the terminology, the terminological framework of those uh, systems, the kind of names which people use, um, they're called classificatory. And the under, the, uh, that just means that when you say my mother, my son, my daughter, whatever, it refers not to an individual, but to a class of individuals. Two sisters will say, in effect, my sister's child is my child. So in, in principle, if your sister's child falls, falls down, that's your child and he rushed to pick the child up. You don't say, oh, that's just your child. You haven't got like property rights, mine versus thine in terms of children or any other relationship. Um, and um, I was very interested many years ago to work out how on earth that uh, structure of kinship could have emerged. And just can, I, I hope you can immediately see we're now talking about morality. If, you're, if you mustn't have sex with your sister, if it's, a pro, if it's prohibited, if you must respect your mother-in-law, if there are things which you can do and can't do according to collective uh, agreement, really we're talking about group level uh, morality. We're talking about a, a community that has moral um, uh, beliefs, moral um, prohibitions, moral expectations right across the community. And, and it's, however much you might say, and I tried to stress this last week, that some chimpanzees like the bonobos are quite nice, and they are, <laughs> from a human standpoint, standpoint, they're much more sort of cuddly and, and friendly and and you know, we can relate to them, I think, more easily, on, even on a moral, moral basis. And, and uh, by the way, bonobos are very sort of almost instinctively um, helpful towards each other. They don't kind of need a moral regulatory framework, but humans do have a regulatory framework. There's certain things which are just taboo, thou shalt not, or, although ne not necessarily um, um, opposed to that sort of top down, uh, sort of, you know, rather dismal, dismal way. Hunter gatherers have an enormous amount of fun and laughter. And, um, and, and actually laughter is one of the devices which makes sure that everyone's um, cheerful and, and part of a community. And, and you, you don't want to get laughed at, but you certainly will do if you start misbehaving. Um, so can you see what I'm trying to say? If you're, if you're attempting to explain, for example, the incest taboo, the famous incest taboo, central to Freudian theory, central, of course, to Claude Lévi-Strauss's theory of human origins, if you're attempting to explain it, you'll find before I wrote my book, and actually after I wrote my book as well, because in some ways not a lot of notice was taken, you'll find that the theories are all of a, of a kind. Um, and um, well, let me just take the most, the most authoritative, if you like, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Claude Lévi-Strauss says that the female of the species has always been an instrument in transactions between males. And his theory of the origin of the incest taboo is you have a group of males over here, a group of males over there. And if they'd been chimpanzees, each group of males would be hanging on to their daughters and sisters and, and females. They, each group says, these are my females, let's keep hold of them. But what happened according to Lévi-Strauss is that kind of one day, um, the males over here realized that if they were to surrender their sisters to the other group of males over here, maybe those males over there would surrender their sisters to us. You'd have an exchange of women and therefore, you don't want to be having sex with your own women because otherwise you won't have a gift to make to the other group and therefore you won't have a relationship between men. And so the, that's, that's the origin of the incest of you. The reason you don't have sex with your sisters is to make a gift of your sisters to other men and expect another gift uh, in return. And um, that is the theory. And I think it's pretty much, if there is a sort of social anthropological kind of mainstream theory to this day, it's that. I don't know, I'm looking at your faces, it's a bit hard, we all got to wear masks. Um, from a Darwinian standpoint, it is utterly inconceivable that rules about sexual abuse, harassment, rules about sexual morality were invented by the male of the species and imposed on the female. It makes absolutely no sense. If there is some harm in, in incest, um, if there's, for example, you can argue, it's not all that convincing, but there's a sort of genetic case to be made that the incest in the future, it may lead to genetic problems and it kind of does over time, but very, very, it's a, it's a very long, long chain of causality. 
Uh, there's no immediate problem with having incest. Biologically, horse breeders use it all the time. It's, it's kind of, you know, chimpanzees don't bother them much at all. Ch common chimpanzees, the, the, the male relatives, are dominant over their, feet, over their sisters and, and daughters, and they quite often attempt incest and get away with it. And in fact, you can say there's kind of no such thing as incest in that, in that human categorical sense. If there is any problem, it's the female who suffers. The male's got, you know, just I'm looking at talking about biology now, a, a male's got, you know, a large number of sex cells. You get somebody pregnant, somebody else, somebody else, there's kind of no limit to the number of females a male can get pregnant. If, if, if one of those pregnancies leads to a deformed offspring because of some genetic defect, well, plenty of other females. The male doesn't, it's not, and from a Darwinian standpoint, there's, there's, it's not, it's, the costs aren't very great because you can always get somebody else pregnant. From a female standpoint, and I'm thinking now purely biologically, that's one of your babies. You might have four, five, six in your whole lifetime. And if there are some costs, the female will experience those costs. And anyway, we know from, from the bonobos that it is the females who are likely to resist sexual harassment, much more likely than the males. So why then is it, that's the question I was asking when I wrote my book, that all these theories and it's, and they all assume that if, if you have to choose one of the sexes, it's going to be the male of the species. And so you have man the hunter, man the toolmaker, man, all these different things about what men, what men do. But in addition, you have man who invents uh, the incest taboo as, in order to establish relationships between males. And I just knew that just had to be wrong. It's crazy. So how would females establish something like sexual morality? Well, we looked last week. Some of you, were, I know, weren't here. I know this is kind of the first week of term as far as UCL is concerned. But if you look at bonobos, you form alliances. If a female wants to refuse sex from some male that's harassing her, she needs to find another female. If she's young, maybe her mother will help. Maybe, you know, sisters. Maybe, of course, sons and brothers can help. But you need to form alliances. And in a way, that's all my theory is saying, except that primate coalitions come in two kinds. You can have coalitions designed to dominate others, or you can have coalitions formed to resist being dominated. And the coalitions formed to establish dominance are always limited. There's only so many individuals who will be in that coalition. The only way in which you could in principle get an ever extending coalition is through resistance. Because when you're resisting, the wider your resistance spreads, the stronger you are. And in principle, you can imagine um, a coalition of everyone. And in fact, one of the major theories of human origins is Christopher Boehm's theory of reverse dominance, where he does posit a, a, a coalition of everyone resisting the, the alpha male. Um, and um, menstruation comes into it. We're not going to discuss that this evening because it would, it's, it's a very important topic. It's absolutely central to my book. Um, sorry? Yeah, why aren't we discussing it? Why aren't we discussing it? Why, Camilla, Camilla saying, why aren't we discussing it? Um, partly because we've got the expert on menstruation here, just behind me, piping up now and again, <laughs> Camilla. All right, uh, very, all right, I'm trying to be, I, I wasn't intending to give a, a lecture, but I, I will. Okay, so now, the, the way I put it in my book was wrong. We, we, you know, we all make mistakes. So in my book, I envisaged that, okay, you've got a female cycle and ovulation is a yes signal. Ovulation means translating into words, uh, you can get me pregnant. Menstruation means the opposite. If you're menstruating, you're not going to get pregnant. But of course, there's a long story. And I, the reason I didn't want to go into it is because it's a long story. But in the, in the build up to becoming um, sort of anatomically human and, and symbolically and politically um, human, in the build up, a number of things happened. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Okay, you can have two extreme sort of cartoon images of sexual dynamics. One's the harem model. You have an alpha male. The males have fought, fought among themselves. One male or two males, maybe anyway, one male has ended up with a monopoly of sex. You've got a harem. And that's fine for the females if they're baboons. Um, because what does the female want from the male? She essentially needs a bit of sperm to get pregnant with. After that, she doesn't really need more sex. A little bit of sperm goes a long way. It gets you 
completely pregnant. So if all you need from the male is sperm, um, sharing that male with others is absolutely fine, no problem at all. But supposing in the course of human evolution, something rather odd has been happening. Supposing you've got a primate, like a chimpanzee, that's begun to walk on two legs. I won't go into why we began to walking on two, walking on two legs, <laughs> but we, we did. And once, the, once it, these uh, um, hominins, we call them, going right back about six or seven million years ago, began walking on two legs, it meant that the males had their hands free and could in principle bring back food, eventually going hunting and bringing back meat. And meat is very different from sperm, because with meat, 10, time, 10 males can bring back 10 times as much as one. And, and it's not true that a little goes a long way. And it's not true that a whole bunch of females can make do with one, one male hunting for you when you're in a, a four or five, you know, 12 females. That's not nearly as good as having one each, having a male each. Okay, is that fairly obvious? So what happened is instead of what would happen in a harem system where the female only needs to have sex to get pregnant, she then, in that system, I'm now going back to baboons, that's a cartoon model of baboons, I'm not really talking about hemodryas baboons or gelato baboons in any rigorous sense, but that, in that system, the female can, have, can actually have a, a reason to save time on sex, because all she needs is to get pregnant, she doesn't want to waste time, once she's pregnant, that's it, and she doesn't need the male anymore, so saving time on sex becomes the name of the game. So how does the female save time and sex? By giving accurate time-saving information, but with her body signaling to the male, this is the time to get me pregnant. And you can see, can't you, from the point of view of the harem holder, the top baboon, the, the, the alpha male, from his point of view, he wants to save time and sex. Because if, if he's given time-saving information, he could say, right, get her pregnant today. Looks like she might be you know, ovulating tomorrow, get her pregnant. So each side is saving time on sex. Right, now come to humans. Imagine a, a new technolo technological invention. It's not a hoover, it's not a washing machine. It's a machine which allows you to save time on sex. How popular is that gonna be? I mean, we enjoy sex and we enjoy sex throughout the cycle. And we don't wanna save time. <laughs> the more time you waste, the better. And you can argue, and I do argue, that the human female has evolved to be from the standpoint of, if you like, the Pope or somebody that thinks sex is just to get pregnant with, the human female has evolved to be the biggest time waster in the animal kingdom. Okay, I hope you understand my meaning when I say that, because the female doesn't give away any time-saving information. She keeps it a secret. That's called concealed ovulation, along with continuous sexual receptivity. The male is kept confused. When's the right time to have sex? She's not going to tell him because actually, her, it's as if her body has got a kind of wisdom developed over evolutionary time. Don't give the male the time to have information, otherwise he's going to get you, get you pregnant and, and, and run off, disappear, get somebody else pregnant, leaving you with a baby. You don't want that. So the human female has evolved to put a spanner in the works of that, that um, sexual dynamics. Saving time on sex isn't what humans are about. But once the human female, and we're now talking about, I don't know, two million years ago, beginning of Homo erectus, I'm not going to go into dates in any, <laughs> again in any detailed way. Once the human female had phased out ovulation or estrus as a, as a signal indicating fertility status, what that did, it, 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 it left salient another signal, which had been of very little interest previously. So, um, Human females, of course, aren't the only primates that uh, menstruate. Um, gorillas do, chimpanzees do, but the, a, a chimpanzee male is not, not very interested in menstruation because it got far more exciting, big sexual sweating called estrus that, that conveys immediate um, you know, fertility. But phase out those other signals and menstruation suddenly becomes salient, becomes significant. Because what menstruation does, it would signal to a, a male, in, imagine a group of females in a camp most are breastfeeding, you know, most are um, pregnant and, and one or two girls from time to time or women um, either start menstruating for the first time or resume their cycles. Suddenly, can you see what's happening? The male would have to be, from a, a purely Darwinian point of view, interested in that signal because it tells him this female, she might have just come into you know, circulation, reached puberty, this female, female will be fertile in a, in, a, in a very short period of time. And it's true, and, and, and 
Jerome's here with us <laughs> this evening, is true that hunter gatherers are excited by menstruation and have a belief, which is absolutely a correct belief, of course, that you, if you want to get somebody pregnant, you have sex with them while, in, while they're menstruating. From our point of view, it's not quite right. But in a, in a hunter-gatherer community, of course, if you're having sex with somebody who's menstruating, very shortly, um, she might be pregnant. And so now the problem here is that if that, that signal as left as a biological signal, left, if you like, in the raw state, just menstruation, can you see what's going to happen? It, it, and I, I have to keep stressing, we're, we're, we're now going right back to before you get this thing called, you know, formal kinship, before we've got group level morality, we're just apes, if you like. Any male would be interested in menstruation. And the risk is that the, the young woman who is cycling, signaling her fertility will attract male attention from her sisters who might be pregnant or breastfeeding, and you're going to get a conflict. The different males, just as in the past, they might have been fighting over um, estrous females. Now they're going to be fighting over, if, if something's not done, over the female who you can get pregnant. So, be, so menstruation will be a signal, like letting all hell get this, let this. So I, I, now I, my assumption is that the, in the previous period, females have been forming alliances in order to, you know, keep males behaving. So let's just assume that that continues. What will the females do if we expect them to form an alliance when some girl begins to menstruate? They will clearly need to grab hold of her, bond with her, and signal to any male that wants to have sex with her, no, <clears throat> if you want to get close to her, <clears throat> you're gonna to have to be nice to all of us. Um, and so um, menstruation will be a, a signal prompting a coalition, a particularly strong coalition between the females to, to prevent would-be dominant males from picking and choosing between females on the basis of their biological fertility status. And then once you've got that idea, female is going to bond around anyone who's menstruating and prevent males from fighting over her. Now, how do those females form a united front to prevent males from picking and choosing? And we've got here the, in, the, in the room, we've got Ian Watts. He's an archaeologist. He's actually the world's specialist on the ochre record of human evolution. He probably won't be saying a huge amount this evening because we've got so much to discuss. But the, the world's first art was not painted on cave walls. It was on the body. And we have a theory, and it's a theory which, is, which has made predictions, and every single one of those predictions has come out beautifully correct as, as more and more data has, has emerged. And the theory is that art was cosmetics, and it was red cosmetics. Any red substance will do to form a united front to prevent males from picking and choosing between different females on the grounds who is menstruating and who is not. And by covering yourselves in red cosmetics, you are presenting a united front. And red ochre is the form of cosmetics, which because it's a mineral, it's a red clay, of course, iron oxide, it's, it survives in the archaeological record. And we can actually date, and Ian has dated, the, the sequences of, of use of ochre, more and more and more ochre. Actually, actually, red ochre is the, it's like the signature of the emergence of Homo sapiens. It's like wherever modern humans spread in Africa and whenever they went across the world, they were saying, we're here. And you can tell they're here because of the ochre, a huge valuing of this beautiful substance, this red ochre pigment. It was like mine, it was like their gold. It was, it was traded all over the place. It was very high quality um, blood red um, ochre. And so this red ochre came to symbolize the thing I've been talking about, female collectivity, female solidarity, uh, sexual defiance. Ochre meant some things are sacred, our bodies are sacred, no means no, it's not just negative, behave you men, stop fighting each other, don't fight over us, go out and do something useful, maybe in Africa, you know, go and get a zebra, bring back the zebra uh, to camp uh, and we'll think about it. That would be something like the message which women would have given on a once a month basis. Um, now, what do I do Camilla? Um, because I've, I've made, uh, that is the theory. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Say a little bit about the moon and then maybe read your story. Okay, right. Okay. Now, Try the moon. Try the moon. Right. Okay. <laughs> I mentioned that other primates have a, a menstrual cycle. Chimpanzees have a menstrual cycle. Bonobos have a menstrual cycle. 
you know the length of a bonobo menstrual cycle? Do you think it's roughly the length of the moon cycle? If you do, you're wrong. <laughs> it's 40 days on average. Common chimpanzee, length of the cycle, 36 days. Orangutans, around 28 to 29. Gibbons, roughly 28. So there are kind of a, 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 like more than the moon's length, less than the moon's length, you know, like a scatter with the different uh, great apes and, and of course other primates as well that have menstrual cycles. The one primate, the one great ape that has a menstrual cycle exactly the length you would predict if in the evolutionary past, evolving females had gained a benefit by synchronizing using some you know, clock up in the sky. The one female who's got that length of cycle is the human, 29.5 days. And Camilla can perhaps discuss this. Since we've had menstrual apps, it's actually become more and more clear that 29.5 days is precisely the length of the menstrual cycle at a time in life when you're like, most likely to be fertile, late teens, early 20s, um, and particularly if you have a, the, the body mass index not being too you know, well fed, the, the, the relatively lean body mass index that the hunter gatherers have. It comes at an average, but an, it's, it's, a, it's a mean length. Of course, of course, your cycle length varies, of course it does, but the mean length. So it's 29.5 days. Now, it could be a coincidence that it's exactly the length it takes for the moon to pass through its phases as seen from the Earth. But before dismissing it as a coincidence, why not explore whether there might not have been um, a biological adaptive explanation? As soon as you look into the possible adaptive explanations, it, it, it begins to hit you between the eyes. I, when I wrote my book, by the way, I didn't know about the lions. I didn't know that lions have, I knew they had been a brilliant night vision, but don't forget we evolve in Africa with lions all around. Lions hunt by night, they've got superb not, not night vision, and they prefer to hunt when they don't have to run very far because they can just pounce on you. So around dark moon in Africa, you don't go out at night, um, at least traditionally you didn't, because you're likely to be, if you're going, it could be a young man in the past, you are going out looking for a romance, and before you arrive at your sweetheart's camp, um, you've been a lion's um, breakfast, because you, and you didn't know what was pouncing at you. So that's this sort of mean, it would mean a rhythm. You travel abroad, you, it's like aggregation and dispersal, a, a, rhythm, a regular rhythm of coming together and, and, and segregating. The moon would have been the fundamental clock. Um, and of course, by following the moon, because we've all got the same moon, and it's, when it's full, it's full for everyone. And when it's new or dark, it's new or dark for everyone. If you time menstruation ritually for the dark moon, that means that your strike will be your, what I'm calling a sex strike, will be super effective. If you're trying to go on sex strike, I don't know how relevant that is today, but if, you, if you're trying to go on sex strike, you don't want to be just on sex strike in this particular locality, because males can be very mobile and they move, move around somewhere else to find somewhere where the women aren't on sex strike. If you really want to have it a very effective um, means of exercising leverage against the male sex, you don't just want a local strike, you want a general strike. Um, and you get a general strike, very simple, just by following the moon. Because when the moon's dark, if all, if all women are either really menstruating or at least in a ritual ceremony, um, declaring we, our bodies are sacred using cosmetics, wherever the men go, the moon's dark. Um, and, and, and so therefore your strike will be extraordinarily um, effective. Have I said enough on that subject? Not quite. Not quite. No. Yeah. Following the same logic, says Ian. Ian needs to come here. Ian, I'm going to ask Ian to just come up here, and you have to stand exactly here, otherwise you're not on the Zoom. Yep. Go on, Ian, take it away. The other aspect to it is is that um, if if moonlight, the nights leading up to full moon optimizes available natural light and that's when you do your traveling that's also when you should be going out collective big game hunting because this all, all you've got is a spear you're a group of men you, you can't guarantee that you're going to be successful that day you might need to be away from a home base for a day or two so so that's got to be around full moon that that's why from from that perspective the strike action has to have been before that, at dark moon. So that generates this, this syntax of blood encoded ritual power being turned on at dark moon by these female led coalitions. 
and holding on to that power until full moon when the successful hunters return and surrender the product to the women who are controlling the cooking fire, remove the blood, blood taboos are lifted, and now you enter into honeymoon. So it's very simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, very simple. It, it, it is very simple, and of course, everyone knows it, because anyone who knows anything about mythology will know that the, 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 the one thing about the world's myth, myths is that it, it all has the same logic. Uh, I, I'll tell you really nicely and quickly, the, you can think of, I don't know, Little Red Riding Hood or Sleepy Beauty, whatever it is, but anyway, it's as follows. You're in this world, it's the world of the living. You're among the living. Then there's a flow of blood. The flow of blood transports you to the other world, the world of the dead. So you've gone from life to death. And there's nothing magic about that, it's just, you were alive, now you're dead, okay? Now comes the magic bit. You come back from the dead. Okay, that's it. Now, the way my book describes it is that that is something which actually happened because as you, as you had this coalition at Dark Moon, you were all with your blood. You were not with your marital partners. At Dark Moon, you're with your sisters, your mother, your blood, your brothers. At full moon, everything switches. So can you see what's happening? It's as if at full moon, sister dies and is replaced by wife. Brother dies and is replaced by husband. We all change our skin at full moon. But then at dark moon, can you see what's happening? If you've got a sex strike, if you're, if you're all on strike because strike, you've got this ritual, no one is anymore a wife. No one is a husband. The wife has died, replaced by her sister, by the sister. The husband's died. So can you see it's like... It's like death and life. You die in, that, in one role, but you come alive in another role. And the, and, this, and the roles are kind of exchanged or reversed according to whether it's, you're talking about full moon or dark moon. Those are, and, the, and you'll find it works beautifully. And if you go carefully through Claude Levy's sources, mythology, four volumes of <laughs> extraordinarily exhaustive studies of the myths of North and South America, and then it, and you can easily extend it, you'll find that something like that logic, that binary logic, to and fro logic between waxing and waning moon underlies the world's myths and and and, and again you, you kind of know that you know that there's nothing very magic about the sun if you want wizardry you know magic it's every kid knows this it's to do with the moon you know not just fairy tales every kid knows that the, the sun is a little bit boring you know it's up there and it gives you light and stuff and and by the way lots of light again if you can see everything with your eyes it's not very magic you need shade you need shadows you need darkness to have um to have magic and now i'm going to stop all this because um mm -hmm. I, I want to do well i don't know shall i, shall I read it out i just got i've got a, a wonderful story here it's in my book it's in the chapter called the sex strike and uh it's called the seven sisters um and it comes from the uh, californian um uh a group, uh, the, Louis, uh, the Louis Enyo. Um, there were seven brothers married to seven sisters. Now, they weren't brothers married to sisters. You had seven brothers married to women who were themselves sisters, okay, who lived in a large hut together. The men went daily to hunt rabbits and the women to gather roots of flags um, for food. The husbands invariably reported bad luck in their hunt with the exception of the youngest who without fail handed his wife a rabbit. This continued every day until the females held a conference and became convinced that they were being cheated by their partners. They agreed that the youngest sister should remain at home the next day under pretext of having a pain in her jaw and so watch the return of the party. Next day, the men as usual took their bows and arrows and set forth. The six sisters then departed, leaving the other concealed among the flags and rushes at the back of the hut in a position from which you could see all that happened inside. Several hours before sunset, the hunting party returned laden with rabbits, which they commenced roasting and eating, except one which the youngest set apart. The others called him a fool and bade him eat the remaining one, which he refused to do, saying he still had some affection for his wife and always intended to reserve one for her. More fool you, said the others. We care more for ourselves than for these root diggers. When they had finished, they carefully, they carefully hid all the evidence 
of their great feast. When all this was later reported to the sisters, they cried a great deal and talked over what they should do. Let us turn ourselves into water, said the eldest. That would never do, responded the rest, for in that case, our husbands would drink us. The second proposed being turned into stones, which was rejected on the ground of being trodden upon by the fraternity. The third wanted them to turn themselves into trees, which was not accepted, because then they would be used for firewood. Everything proposed was put aside until it came to the turn of the youngest. Her proposition to change themselves into stars was objected to on account of being seen, but overruled as they would then be out of reach. The women proceeded to the lagoon where they daily collected flag roots and constructed a machine impossible to describe out of reeds and ascended to heaven and located themselves at the Pleiades. These seven stars still retain the names of the originals. Is it fairly clear? <laughs> These men were eating their own kill. They were hunting rabbits and eating them. They were cheating on their wives. The wives had found out, what do we do? They wondered what to change themselves into to get back at the men. And everything they thought of, the water, the stones, the, the wood, the men could use. And then stars. And of course, the beauty of being the stars is up in the sky, they're still there. The men can see them in all their beauty. They can desire the seven sisters, but they'll forever be out of reach. And that is a beautiful myth describing what I've called sex strike. It's just, it's perfect. But of course, there are all kinds of variations on that theme. And I'm, 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 I think I'm going to stop now. I, there's another whole lot of stuff I could read out if we get a moment later on about Aboriginal Australian landscape. But I, I, I think it would probably be best to end with that lovely story and to say that that story you can look at the story and you can find variations on that theme, endless variations, in fact. In fact, it's one of the stories which connects up all the other stories in, in, in North America and South America. And of course, the Pleiades is a lovely fact we found out recently about the Pleiades, <laughs> which is that nowadays, you try looking at the Seven Sisters, you can only see six of them. The, the actual, the way we see those stars from the Earth has changed over thousands of years. I think it's true to say that the last time you could see Seven Sisters clearly with the naked eye, was something like 100,000 years ago. It just shows how old that story is. Okay, Chris, th thank you so much. Thank you for that. So, um, intro to basics of sex strike theory with, with Ian's help and uh, a, a bit of a section from Blood Relations. Um, the idea here, because we've got quite a few um, anthropologists who've been influenced by blood relations, was that we'd have some contributions. I know, Ian, do you want to come back and say something about your involvement with blood relations originally and what's changed in the interim of uh, 30 years or whatever? Can you do that? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll we'll maybe go to Jerome and I'll put the three of you. Yeah, I, I was very lucky in, in the timing of when I got interested in, in human origins. It was just as the whole field was being transformed in the late 80s. Uh, this was when geneticists had first been able to claim that, that all the world's women could trace their, their, their ancestry back to a last common ancestress who lived in Africa. They estimated around 200,000 200, years ago. This shook up the whole field because up until then, the prevailing idea had been that we had sort of multi-regional origins, which in some places were probably going back 2 million years, which made it would be impossible to make sense of the kinds of symbolic structures, uniformities that Levi Strauss is talking about, or Chris is talking about in blood relations, if you had a, a time depth of measured in millions of years. If your time depth is just a couple of hundred thousand years, then things can look very different. And as Chris was saying in, 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 in blood relations, um, follow the Oka record. Well, you know, I, I, I first read it before, I, actually, I didn't read Blood Relations first. It, was, it wasn't published. Uh, it was uh, his thesis back in 88. 
And um, it wasn't until I got into sort of postgraduate study in, in about 91, which is when the book came out, that I was able to really pursue the ochre record. And obviously the place to pursue it was in Africa. And on the basis of the paleontology and the genetics, we knew roughly where and when our species evolved. And, and we had another species to compare with, the Neanderthals. But I just focused on the Southern African archaeological record and also the, the, the anthropological record, the social anthropological record of, of hunter-gatherers of Southern Africa. And of course, everything fitted beautifully in terms of the, the, the syntactical predictions about how ritual power is mobilized um, and the role of the moon. And it turns out that, that African hunter-gatherers to this day, which we never actually predicted, that their most productive form of hunting is still around full moon in the dry season. This is simply by virtue of the fact that this is when the animals aggregate at the few remaining water holes and they do a lot of their drinking at night. So human hunters do the same. And, be, and it's the lights, nights leading up to full moon because they don't want to be competing with the lions who are dark moon hunters. But anyway, going back to the ochre record, I, at the time in, in, the, in the 90s, I was able to show that this was a habitual, regular behavior going back in Africa at least 100,000 years. Um, and at the time, the consensual view was that there was no evidence for symbolic culture until 40,000 years ago. And it was all European. Um, and it took, it took a good 10 years to shift that prejudice you know, it, it, of new discoveries in Africa and finally recognizing the significance of some old discoveries. And, and so that began to happen around 2000. And gradually, as, as new dating techniques have become more widely applied, we've been able to push back that limit of regular use of red ochre in campsites in Africa back to about 170,000, which is falling within the time frame of our speciation. The speciation itself is a bit more spread out than originally conceived, sort of say between 150 and 300,000. And so what we're able, what we're claiming to be able to do is integrate an understanding of behavior and more specifically symbolic culture into our models, our evolutionary models of our speciation, that we're no longer reliant on just the fossils and the genes. And the stone tools have never told us much in the first place. We know that there's cultural evolution, but we're not interested in that particularly. That goes back millions of years. We're interested in symbolic culture. What makes us human, uniquely human, without denying that Neanderthals may have achieved the same. So, I mean, that's, that's been my contribution for the last sort of 25 years or so, is just focusing on that record. But right now I'm sort of switching back to social anthropology and going back to African hunter-gatherers, trying to complete the circle. I will just say that, <laughs> Ian's often a bit too modest. Ian is, was part of the team um, that discovered the world's first art at Blomba's Cave um, in South Africa. And it made the headlines all over the place. And as Ian was kind of saying in relationship to the book, that I, I, okay, what, I, I went with the consensus of the time when I was writing this book. The consensus was that this thing, which I call the human revolution, and, and everyone was talking then about the human revolution, that I was, you know, the archaeologist said it happened about 40,000 years ago. It was the Upper Paleolithic uh, Revolution in Europe. So the world's first art was the cave paintings of the Dordogne. Ian was already tugging at my sleeve saying, Chris, they got it all wrong. They got it all wrong. <laughs> Before you publish a book, change it, change it. I sort of changed it vaguely at one or two pages. But, but what Ian was telling me, he said, Chris, the world's first art won't be the cave paintings of, of, of Europe. It'll be way, way, way earlier. And, it will, and I said, well, all right. I'll make a prediction, Ian. You go to Africa, and when you find the world's first art, I could tell you what it would be based on my book. It'll be masses of beautiful blood red ochre. And Ian was the ochre specialist in the team at Blobber's Cave, which discovered not just ochre pigments, but, but actually little, little pots for mixing the pigment, little tools for, uh, you know, for spreading it and mixing it with grease, little crayons with carefully 
you know, sharp outlines to obviously made to make a sharp outline of color on a surface, we think the body. And, um, and so Ian was, Ian, Ian is, you know, he is the world's specialist in ochre. I mean, of course, looked, there are some other specialists, but uh, he was the leading specialist. And, he, and to be part of the, the team that discovered the world's first art is no small um, achievement. <clears throat> Yeah, th th thank you very much. Thanks, Ian, because, I mean, just to back up Chris here, really Ian's one of the first people to push the notion that human symbolic culture starts in Africa and it's not Eurocentric as the original human revolution model of the 90s um, were, was holding. Um, and um, so uh, I, I think um, he, he needs the most recognition for that. Um, and we're going to hear more next week from Ian on the OCO when we also have the artist Anne Golifer speaking, um, who's an artist who works in Botswana, and she's visiting here um, uh, this next month. So um, we're, we're going to have a, a really interesting programme on origins of art as ochre, but also modern and contemporary art using traditional forms of earth, earth pigment. Um, including um, Herrero uh, artists. Um, I, was, I was picking up Blood Relations just a few moments ago and saying it was a book that changed my life. So I'll try and say a little bit more about that. Um, Radical Anthropology, this class, uh, likes to call itself the London's longest running evening class. And we were boasting last week that it's actually 40 years old. Um, I didn't come for the first 10 years. It took me about, or, or for the first eight or nine years. I was busy during the 1980s trying to work out questions about, were women always oppressed? Was there any society where women could have power, um, leadership agency and, and, and so forth? Reading things like Engels, reading all the great goddess books like Merlin Stone and, and um, Monica um, Shu and so forth. Um, and not able to come to any big conclusions, but I had a lot of background. I did classics as a, a student undergraduate. So I had a lot of background in mythology and I suddenly saw this um, advert in what the old Time Out magazine, which was myth, magic and folklore with a, like a, a witchy, witch on a broomstick silhouette. And I realized that is a man going to be talking, a mere man going to be talking about, uh, mythology and I bet I know more than him so I'm going to go and heckle him <laughs> and so we had a couple of sessions and this was in little community centers we're, we're trying to be very respectable these days by setting up in UCL anthropology but this was in little community centers not far away in Camden and and so he started to talk about you know, blood relations was almost on the almost being published at that style um, so Chris started to talk about these stories, like the story you just read, the, the sex drug story of the Californian Indians, Sleeping Beauty, the fairy tales. And he started interpreting this in terms of the sex drug, in terms of a human evolution story of uh, female collectivity, created human solidarity, created the whole of human culture. And I'm just like, what? This is, wow, this is now explaining everything. And it wasn't just explaining everything, it was doing so in, a, in an extremely materialistic way in terms of um, just what Ian said about the you know, menstruation, women saying no to sex, means the men go hunting, the men uh, bring back the hunt to the fire, and then putting that in terms of the archeology span of the ice age or the previous ice ages, um, it, it was very Eurocentric at that point, as Ian said, rather than focused on Africa. But it, but it suddenly like brought everything together in a way that never heard before. I'd hardly heard of anthropology then. I hardly knew what it was. Um, so suddenly this opened doors to the possibility of uh, anthropology, understanding you know, women's real role through evolution and history and, ha and how that, that changed. Um, so I began to decide, right, I need an education. I need to go and get an education. Came here to UCL to do a master's of anthropology and then an MPhil and PhD. Um, but what was extraordinary about Chris uh, was that in his book and everybody who, I mean, this is why he's such a maverick with blood relations. 
was he was bringing together all this data, all this interdisciplinary data, um, you know, incredibly detailed scholarly material on primates, primate sex lives, primate cycles, um, detailed scholarly material on menstru you know, the influence of the moon on menstruation and all this, so biological material. Um, but then also this rich uh, mythology that he'd um, drawn on through his, uh, from his PhD, analyzing Levi-Strauss, or the mythology of Levi-Strauss, analyzing especially Australian hunter-gatherer materials, um, and the wonderful chapters towards the end of the book on the rainbow snake, the Aboriginal Australian. I hope we're going to get some talks by Chris later specifically on the rainbow snake. Um, and you know, he's, so he's bringing together symbolic anthropology with biological anthropology, and then all the detail of archaeology as well. Now, this, you know, this just hadn't been done in anthropology for years. Like, you have to go back to, like, James Fraser back in, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan back in the 19th century, that you could get this kind of total interdisciplinary bringing together. It, there's been a complete divide between social anthropology and biological anthropology in recent times, in recent history, an almost failure of the disciplines to, to talk to each other, which has been an absolute disaster for understanding human origins. So when myself and Ian started doing PhDs, we were working here in the 90s and, and, and since then, we were kind of trying to go against all this tide to try to bring together, so we both of us studied in archeology, span social anthropology, biological anthropology, trying to get all these different disciplines talking to each other um, in, a, in a way that could, you know, the, the way that must be necessary for understanding of human origins. How can we understand it without those disciplines? And in many ways, it isn't, of course, the only vital, but, but social anthropology has to be vital, or cultural anthropology has to be vital for understanding ourselves as a symbolic species, because social anthropology is the discipline which deals with the symbolic, deals with mythology, deals with ritual, deals with ideology and cosmology. And um, so it's got to be like the key, the, you know, the keystone of the arch, really. Um, and in many ways, social anthropologists had just sort of, you know, we're, we're not going to deal in evolution, we're not going to deal in, in um, talking about human origins, that that stuff is what was Evans Pritchard's words about human origins? Dead as muffin. Dead as, Ar arguments. Arguments yeah. about origins yeah. are as dead as, as muffin. muffin. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean that, and and you particularly worked on the primate material that you used in here with Robin Dunbar, yeah. who was here at that time and became my teacher, particularly in the masters doing stuff on primates. But what did Robin? What was his well, reaction? Well, he, he, he said the revolutions in science well seldom happen, but I, I, I consider this work, you know, the beginnings of a revolution in science, putting all the different, different disciplines together. Robin was extremely supportive in mm. those days. Mm. I think he became a little bit more um, sort of distant when he became more <laughs> celebrated and famous because he's a little bit worried about politically where all this might end up. And, um, and uh, so, um, I, I, you know, I, 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah but, but, I, but the point is that okay. he was no, very no, excited let me, let me about... Yeah. What, what, yeah, just say, yeah what, what Robin said, what Robin said was, um, he knew I was, I'd started out reading um, um, Frederick Engels, and he said, there's no question that, for, that Frederick Engels, if he was alive today, would be a behavioural ecologist. He would be doing the kind of Darwinism um, that Robin himself was doing. And I, I, perhaps I should just say, read if you can, Robin's magnificent book, Social Systems. It's a wonderful book yes, discussing absolutely. how absolutely political non-human primates are. Don't, don't think politics is something humans do. All, all the different monkeys and apes are profoundly political creatures. They form alliances. They almost have votes to, before they, they make moves. It's a, it's a marvelous, wonderful, the best thing ever written to this day, in my view, is, is Robin's um, fantastic book. OK, why, why not say something, Jerome, and then we can ask them to questions. Okay, well, um, greetings, everybody. Uh, I, I'm sorry not to be with you, just uh, had a bit of a problem with my back, so I'm stuck at home. Um, 
Well, look, I, I came to Chris's work before I left for field work in the early 1990s. And uh, it was part of the reading I was doing just generally in preparing to go and live with uh, egalitarian hunter-gatherers. I'd been very inspired by James Wood Woodburn, who was my one of my teachers uh, when I was at LSE. And, and, and I was really keen to go and live with some egalitarian people who had managed to find ways of avoiding all the nastiness of uh, patriarchal structures, the inequalities, the uh, uh, injustices and abuses that such uh, powers held by men resulted in. And I was very fortunate to come across uh, the uh, Bambengele people in northern Congo. And these people had been, because Congo had been for that at that time, a, a, a socialist republic for, for 30 odd years. And as a result, had had no real research done there and also hadn't really developed its industry and, uh, and extractive uh, uh, potential. So the people living in the forests uh, in Northern Congo at the time when my family and I arrived there, and I, I traveled there with my wife, Ingrid, and my son, Nando, uh, were living really uh, in a very effective hunting and gathering society. We, we uh, never had hunger. I mean, we did sometimes miss certain foods because we were uh, getting more meat, for instance, than we would wild roots or something like that. But, but the idea of famine was, was something that was completely alien to these people. And we spent the next three years actually living with uh, the Bambengele. Normally, uh, anthropological fieldwork goes for a, a lasts for about 18 months. But uh, we were actually enjoying living in this forest so much that we had very little interest or intention in returning. Um, we, we, we spent one year in, in the forest, then we returned as we had planned. Then we came back for another year, but ended up uh, two years later still in the forest. and. One of my professors at the time at LSE said to me, oh, I never studied a small scale society because I just thought it would be boring. How would I have a career based on a society with, with not much going on? It would, you know, I'd run out of things to say and, and have to move on. Um, and, and I was shocked by this because actually what we discovered in the forest was that there was such a rich life a rich world that we never missed not having TVs, not having newspapers to read or entertainment or uh, all the things that we think are so valuable in Western culture, all the distractions. Uh, the, the raw life of the community that we lived with was just so fulfilling and so rich that, uh, that those feelings of wanting to come home didn't happen. And actually, this was something which, um, in the end, of course, perhaps just to finish the story, we ended up having to flee because civil war broke out and, uh, and there was a lot of uh, abuse going on, particularly of women, and it, it became dangerous to remain there. And so we, we evacuated via Cameroon uh, and ended up coming home and, and then, of course, uh, had to think about writing a PhD thesis and so on. And... In writing that PhD thesis, Blood, which I had been alerted to by, of course, uh, reading Chris's book, but also by the work of Alain Testard, uh, someone who Chris mentions in the book, who did an extraordinary cataloguing of the different practices of hunter-gatherer societies around the world as studied by anthropologists, and had noticed these really remarkable consistencies in the way that people behaved in relation to blood and the separation of different types of blood, particularly, as Chris mentioned, the blood of menstruation, the blood of human fertility, and the blood of killing, the blood of hunting, uh, male blood. And uh, this was something that was absolutely clear in, in our work with the Bambangeli. This division of blood was, was central to the very organization of society. It was central to the gender division of labor. It's what made it seem logical, natural, and inevitable. And indeed, the Bengeli had a, a, a particular word for it, which took me years to figure out, uh, a word they call ekila, which uh, is very short uh, and sweet, but uh, is, means all sorts of different things. So it can mean blood, just ordinary blood, but it can also uh, be used to mean taboo, something that's forbidden. It can also mean menstruation. It also means the hunter's meat. 
Uh, so when a hunter kills an animal, they have to consume particular parts of the animal, depending on what animal it was and how it was killed. Um, and these rules, of course, which I was documenting, uh, ended up providing me with a huge insight into the way that this society not only organized itself, but actually managed its relations with other species. And in its sort of largest, broadest unfolding was it was a very complex system of forest management based on the very simple but insightful uh, premise that as long as you share everything that you take out of the forest properly with all people present, you will never experience uh, scarcity. You will always experience abundance. And, and, and that insight uh, of Aquila really was something that uh, I, I think has huge relevance for us today. But anyway, I, I pursued my studies without being aware of uh, the radical anthropology group or any of this work going on until one day I was asked to give a presentation at the British Museum at which Chris and Camilla happened to be present. And after they'd heard my presentation, Chris came up to me and said, ah, oh, that's just everything that uh, I've been writing about and talking about for years. And uh, on he went. And I thought, hmm, who is this guy? What does, what does he really mean? And, uh, and so I began reading and it actually took me about a decade to catch up with uh, Chris and Camilla <laughs> because they are such polymaths. Um, but, uh, but then I realized actually, yes, he's, he's correct. <laughs> this really does instantiate the theories within uh, or as exemplified by uh, the hypotheses expressed in blood relations and, and in the future work that uh, Chris and Camilla and, and Ian and, and others indeed have, have done uh, is a living example of, of how this system operates. And as time has gone by and my research has deepened, um, far from being boring and running out of things to say, I'm, I hardly have enough time to write up all the important things that uh, studying people like the Bambangeli reveals about human history, about human, the human condition, indeed about human nature, um, and, and what's precious about human nature. Um, and so it, it has been actually in recent years a huge pleasure to, to, to collaborate uh, particularly with Chris, but also with Ian and Camilla, uh, in developing a, a, a deeper, more precise understanding of the theories expressed in blood relations. And indeed, Chris and I are currently uh, working on completing a, a, a rather wonderful book, uh, which Chris has uh, christened very appropriately, When Eve Laughed. And, uh, and I hope in future uh, rags, we, we will start to present more and more of the extraordinary research that uh, has gone into creating a much more precise and detailed picture of, of how human evolution is uh, progressing. Oh, sorry, has got to the place it is today. Now, on that subject, I just wanted to, I was really quite astonished as I picked up Blood Relations uh, from my bookshelf the other day and, and looked at it. And, and I just you know, stumbled across the first page and I just wanted to read it out, I think, because it's extraordinarily prescient of the issues we face today. And I think is a very powerful reminder of the relevance of this stuff. It isn't esoteric hypothesizing of, you know, just sort of some uh, eccentric anthropologists uh, stuck in their bookshelves uh, uh, and doing weird research with uh, tiny groups of people living in remote places. This really has huge amount to say about our present moment. And so I'll just read, and, and Chris opens the introduction with a quote from uh, Karl Marx. Modern bourgeois society with its relations of production, of exchange and of property, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. And of course, as we uh, face climate catastrophe, uh, this extraordinary uh, race to uh, incredible inequality, uh, a complete lack of sharing uh, of patriarchy gone haywire, um, we, we, we are facing very much that netherworld brought up by the sorcery of capitalism. And so I'll just quote Chris uh, briefly, because I think it, it, it really brings the relevance uh, of, of this book uh, to us all. 
humanity now has the power to destroy not only itself, and remember this is 30 years ago, uh, not only itself, but the most, most of the more complex forms of life on earth. No one can measure the scale of threat posed by our unplanned global economy as it hurtles along on its present course. What seems certain is that the future of our planet now depends on conscious planning decisions which we do not yet know ourselves to be capable of taking. No scientific story about our distant past can avoid this troubling fact about our present, nor escape being shaped by it. Western scientific industrial culture now holds the rest of creation in its shadow. During the four billion years since life first evolved, no living subject has held such power or been vested with such responsibility. It is a realization expressed eloquently by the anthropologist Robin Fox in 1975, when the Cold War was still at its height. In the past, he wrote then, it has not mattered greatly what people believed about themselves and their societies, since nothing that followed from these beliefs could have endangered the species. Man is now rapidly approaching the point, and it will come in the lifetime of his children, when, unless he takes his survival consciously into his own hands, he may not survive as a species. This requires a revolution in thinking, as serious as the Copernican revolution. No man has to move to a species-centered view of the human world he inhabits, and he has to do it quickly, within the next 50 years or even less. And in fact, it's less. But I think that one of the enduring contributions of the uh, theorizing that began in blood relations and has continued since is uh, part of the pathway to, to, to tread uh, in, in finding solutions to this very, very dire situation. And indeed, Chris and I next year will be spending the year trying to write up uh, some of the lessons that life has taught us uh, in the process of, of, of its enduring persistence on Earth. Anyway, I'll end there, and I hope that uh, that will stimulate some of uh, interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerome, uh, for that. Um, do, do you want to add anything, Chris, or should we open this to the floor? Uh, Ian? You should add a bit on, on how you revise. Yeah. I mentioned, that, I mentioned I got one thing wrong in the book, and um, I didn't say uh, what it was. <laughs> well, uh, Chris did talk, did talk about it. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we uh, need to say it all over again. Um, I, I've just said that uh, blood relations is remarkable for being work by fundamentally. Chris started as a social anthropologist, studying here at UCL under. Mary Douglas and Alan Bernard at that time, working on issues of taboo and kinship. Um, and the great revelation for you was one day you heard Mary Douglas lecturing on the island of menstruating men. And you realized that it, it blew your mind. You didn't think menstruation was a key issue, but when you heard about the islanders of Wageo, with the men performing rituals where they were literally cutting open their penises to bleed on a periodic basis, you realize that something very important was up with menstruation. Um, and Chris followed this up by work on Aboriginal Australian ritual of male menstruation of various descriptions. But his approach was thoroughly cultural. It was about culture and taboos around menstruation. Although he was uh, putting it into context of uh, primate societies as the work with Robin Dunbar um, and working at, you know, a, a, a model that was going to be human evolution, was, was a model for human evolution, coming out with this um, lunar mandala with the, the waxing moon and the waning moon as the, the time of ritual and taboo, the time of, of cooking fire and releasing the ritual and taboo. Um, but as I began to study with Robin Dunbar and working on uh, primate social systems, it became clear to me that what menstruation was in terms of biology and what menstruation became in terms of culture, well, menstruation was like the pivot uh, from nature into culture and, and how humans dealt with and started to culturally manipulate 
the signal of menstruation because menstruation is so powerful because it's it is the indicator of imminent fertility it isn't fertility right then and there but imminent fertility this makes it incredibly powerful as a as a, a signal it wasn't originally evolved as a signal but it became so um, and so I delight in saying, oh, Chris, you got it all wrong in blood relations. You said that menstruation was like a no signal, but of course it isn't. It, it is of a great interest for male primates, monkeys, Langer monkeys, um, various monkeys. We've, we've done work, for instance, with Volker Sommer on this. Um, to, with, in the case of chimpanzees and, and somewhat bonobos, because they have very large sexual signals, estrus signals, while males can focus on ovulation more than on menstruation, they don't need to track menstruation. But in any species where there really isn't a good signal of, of ovulation, menstruation is the giveaway. And that's what forces this situation that in ev evolution, our foremothers, our ancestral mothers, they had to deal with the situation around menstruation. And then we can think of the whole panoply of all the taboos on menstruation across cultures. I mean, really, Levi-Strauss wasn't quite right about incest taboo. The menstrual taboos are every way as basic as incest taboos. They're kind of two sides of the coin in many ways. Um, but if, if women establish menstrual taboos because their bodies are sacred, can't touch when they're menstruating, but that is also extends to their sons as an incest taboo. Um, so their sons and male clan relatives as an incest taboo. So it, it's, it, it's absolutely fundamental in the emergence of human culture. Um, but it goes variably across cultures. So for instance, Christian cultures have a kind of a form of taboo of menstruation where you can't even talk about it. You, everything becomes invisible, you suppress completely. Um, and there are reasons for that. We can look at that variability. Um, I think that's, that's enough on that situation. There's all kinds of things about menstrual synchrony and all kinds of things to, to, to be discussed, but perhaps we should have some questions. Um, if anybody here has got any questions, we'd like to to put any, and I'll ask my Zoom folk as well. Yes, please. Thank you, all four of you. That was fantastically interesting. Four to fours. Please forgive me because I'm coming to this theory for the, the first time, so it's probably quite a basic Great. question, uh, starter question. Um, but does the theory posit that um, females would put aside sexual desire, sexual pleasure? entirely for the, 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 the benefits of building a society because it, it, it doesn't seem to have had, um, uh, perhaps, perhaps you mentioned it much more in the book, uh, but, but what's its role in this? <coughs> okay, do you want to, well, Chris, come, come, uh, here. come sorry, here, come yes, here, yeah, no, no. and uh, repeat, repeat the question. Okay, so the, the, the question is, does the theory assume that when menstruation triggers a, a sex strike, that women um, renounce their own sexual pleasure for the sake of the group, for the sake of society, for the sake of culture. And what I really want to stress, of course, is that when you're on a strike against heterosexual sex, a whole world of alternative possibilities <laughs> opens up. Now, when I was here last week, we were talking about the bonobos, and bonobo females, the reason they have their alliances is because when bonobos like with other um, great apes, when, when a female comes of age, she has to move away from her relatives and, and move into an, a, a territory to get pregnant where she's got no kin. But, so she has to manufacture kin. This is the female bonobo, and she manufactures sisterhood by having lesbian sex. But of course, we know that human sexuality is extraordinarily variable and labile. In, in all of us, there are a number of potentials, different potentials. We're not rig rigorously, rigidly heterosexual, Rabbi, do I have to say that? It's, it's blindingly, blindingly obvious. And so the argument is that while you're on sex strike, you're having a whale of a time because there's a thing called, I, I, a shorthand version is to call it carnival sex. During carnival, the world turns upside down. Everyone's having a, an extraordinarily brilliant time, but people are cross-dressing, people are turning into animals, into each other, into males, into females, and so on and so forth. 
And so, th and so what I'm saying is that it's like regular heterosexual sex at one phase of the month. While you're on sex track, think of all the other things you could be doing, as long as it's not the kind of sex that will get you pregnant. So I don't think women, I think women have, an, we've actually got from, again, from Jerome, a wonderful, a wonderful film, actually. It's a, it's a women's uprising, quite a periodic uprising called Ngoku. And those women are having a lot of fun while they're on a kind of sex right, while they're taunting the men. They're doing all kinds of naughty things, um, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just, uh, just to add in a little bit there, um, there's a very famous book uh, on Jeune Poissy folklore, the Bushman uh, by Megan Beasley, which is called Women Like Meat. Um, and that, that title is both, is both sort of riffing on women are like meat, uh, because there's this confusion of women with the animals that men hunt, but also women like meat. And as long as the meat arrives, flesh is to be enjoyed by everybody and, and everybody can then in those circumstances women can relax and enjoy themselves but if you've got the kids crying and everybody's hungry and starving and you've got a man being obnoxious and trying to you know to make demands that is not right that isn't the way it works so we, we've evolved both. I mean, just talking about our evolu bodily evolution, we've evolved both to have an enormous amount of sexual enjoyment, but also to have a lot of control to be able to say yes or no. And that's an aspect both of our biological evolution, but also the kind of moral sense of, of, of you, know, se you know, sex is not just an individual's business alone. It, it concerns the whole society. Thanks. Um, we can have a Zoom question. Yeah, now. let's try and inter integrate. Are there Zoom questions here? We ha haven't kept track of the chat. Is anybody on Zoom who'd like to ask something? Can they use the pointer, the little hand that comes up? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, ra raise hand. Yeah, that's a good one. Have reaction to reactions. Right, yeah. Um, Hand gets raise a hand or, or anybody who is or Kurt, otherwise. Um, no, we don't have to look through the chat. No, I, yeah, I was just checking. Let's have another question from here. If and there's is. there's also Denise here if she wants to say anything. Um, questions from the floor, Gun? Whilst the Zoom people are. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Or discuss how the sex drive, or whatever you want to call it, but how that phenomenon started. And you say it could have, and it's obviously everything has to start small and get big. And you say it could have started off with two sisters, a mother and daughter. Um, and I, but I don't think you say very much about, you know, whether about how it spread. Um, was it? teaching and learning, campaigning essentially, was it just sort of imitation or was it even perhaps partly or mostly, you know, a hereditary, you know, genetics? So the question is, in, in Blood Relations, I talk about this female coalition, sex strike, if you want to call it that, but I don't say very much about the small scale beginnings of it and why, why it might have taken off. Um, I, I suppose I maybe didn't. Um, what I will say is that we have a, a, a wonderful theory which interlocks now with what we've been saying all along, and that's Sarah Hurdy's um, theory about alloparenting. And, and another related theory, and, and by the way, all these theories which are absolutely brilliant come out of, I have to stress this, uh, genetically literate Darwinism. It used to be called self being Darwinism. People are sort of scared of using that term because it got so badly misinterpreted as Thatcherism. But Sarah Hurdy um, and, and, uh, and Kristen Hawkes, Kristen Hawkes developed the grandmother hypothesis to explain menopause. And Sarah Hurdy sort of linked that to another hypothesis to explain how it is we got such, the, the, partly how we got such large brains, but also what happened when to our, to our psychology when uh, childcare was collective and, and kids had to be ad adapting themselves to us eliciting care from more than just one, one mother. 
So the kinds of coalitions they're talking about, so the grandmother hypothesis means women um, are with their daughters, and instead of having kids until late years, they invest in their daughters, we think, there's their, their daughter's offspring. Now that means you've already got a coalition, haven't you? You've got a woman li living with her mum and getting support from her. And then, of course, if you're living with your mum and getting support from her, you're probably living with the sisters. So if you have children, you're going to be sharing that. And I'm, all I'm saying here now is that in that you have the beginnings, because you have the beginnings of a female coalition. And of course, initially, it may be that the, the, the most the, 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 a woman needing some support will get it from her mum and sisters. But why not make the males? you know, useful. I mean, as soon as you've got a coalition, there are going to be conditions placed on sex with a visiting male, I would say. So I'm just saying maybe in the book, I didn't, I didn't know about all that. That, that, that body of theory hadn't developed. But now we do. And that's the answer I would start to give. I would say it's already in those two very standard mainstream, very authoritative theories, the grandmother hypothesis, and the um, other parenting theory, which are absolutely central to thinking these days. And the trouble is, it's so strange that although those two theories are absolutely central, no one apart from Camilla in terms of biological antibodies is sort of just taking it the next step. Sarah Hattie just stops with biology and, and Kristen Hawke doesn't exactly stop because she, she knows about the Hadza, but somehow the, the evolutionary argument, as far as I can work out, we are the only team that thought, well, why not take it that next step from shared childcare and living with mum to you know the whole symbolic explosion that that occurred around the time of our of our emergence as a species. I just add to uh, Chris is absolutely right about the um, the centrality of these these models of kind of female kin coalitions with other parenting and the grandmother hypothesis. But it's also worth saying the the work that I worked on with Ian in the nineties. Um, with Ian's work on the ochre record, that we made an argument that what we call then sham menstruation, or what we call now female cosmetic coalitions, would kind of have two stages. You would keep getting this situation arising of where a female's menstruating, attracting attention of like a dominant, a would be dominant male to try and muscle in, and get hold of that female and the other females who are like her relatives wanting to resist that. So that situation would keep arising, keep arising, like with Homo erectus early, um, like Homo heidelbergensis, whatever, in lower to middle Pleistocene. Um, and females would more or less re be resisting that, really depending on the pressure of brain size, how much, what is the pressure of the energetic requirements for females. But then when, when the energetic requirements of the enormous brain size started to go up in the last half million, 300, you know, in terms of our speciation, we would need to be, that our human ancestors would need to be performing this rituals very regularly because they need to send males away on an absolutely regular basis. They need more work. So we get a sort of step up a gear and we made predictions against this on the archaeology, which uh, on Ian's analysis of the ochre record is well founded, that you get a sort of sporadic beginnings of the ochre record, and then it steps up to a sort of what, what we understand as a kind of sexual selection explosion. Because uh, why is it sexual selection? Because the males who are the men who are willing to invest as hunters, they're willing to do bride service to support the, the females and their offspring, they don't want alpha males, they want the alpha males to get cut out. So therefore they should be choosing females who are producing these red cosmetic picket lines, if we want to use that language. Um, so you suddenly will get a, like a sort of sexual selection takeoff. And that isn't, an, uh, what, what's genetic, I would say, Kevin, is, you know, all the, the social intelligence required for organizing this collectivity, um, being able to, you know, intentionality, collective intentionality, that, that, that's underpinnings of genetics, um, but it's cultural sexual selection. We're being sexually selected on cultural decorative signals. It, so, you know, so, so there's, it's, it's a moot point. Where is, that, where is it coming down to specific 
genetic sequences or not. And because um, Neanderthals also, we've done work with, uh, with Ian and um, Volker on the Neanderthal record of pigment use, Neanderthals also using this. Uh, my bet is that Denny Servans will also be using this. Any of those large encephalized, very large brained recent humans will have also been pushed into that. Um, so that, that would be how I'd answer that, that idea. Right. Any more questions, either Zoom or... Ah, oh, someone on Zoom, thank you. Um, yes, please. Oh, hello. Uh, hello. Hi, um, my name is Fremont. I like to thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, quite a new topic, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I would like to ask a question. I mostly agree with um, with uh, the the. However, uh, I would like to ask what happened. In Go ahead so with the question. Can, can you speak as loud as possible? We can't hear you easily. All right, wait a minute. Um, yeah, what I would like to say is what happened to the female coalition in our contemporary modern society? And where, are, uh, where is the female coalition to coerce and to guide the, 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 the I mean, I. I'm not going to use the, 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 the wrong word here, but, um, you know, the male, um, well, I wouldn't say hunter-gatherers, but um, um, destruction-gatherers. <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah, what happened to this uh, female wonderful coalition that, and control that they have over the male population? And where is the sort of failure of, um, you know, the evolution of uh, uh, how, how did we come to this uh, standstill in, in this um, problematic situation that Jerome uh, really interestingly described. I mean, thank you very much. I mean, you're wonderful people, really. Yeah, you're talking okay. about um, patriarchy in general, and it's a very it's a very big question about the emergence of patriarchy and what we can do about it. I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, I mean, where, where is the female coalition, you know, that uh, actually has any, any sort of um, power over the, you know, the disaster that we, the society has created? <laughs> well, the question is, what happened in, like, earlier human societies to create patriarchy and then the question of today under imperialism capitalism and patriarchy uh where are female coalitions um and that's such a big question i'm not sure if i can answer right can i uh <laughs> offer some oh, okay we'll have another man answering go on go 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 go, go. go on you well look i mean it, yeah briefly Human beings are politically sophisticated animals. There's no question about that. And it's for sure that in our deep history and past, there have been moments where men have succeeded temporarily, probably in, in overcoming through various means, probably through violence, notably uh, those women's coalitions. But uh, any of those ruptures or breaches would have normally, uh, at least if we, base this on the ethnographic record of egalitarian societies, which is what I studied, um, will have been temporary blips, more or less organized around a particular charismatic male who manages to uh, uh, persuade other males to join him in a counter coalition to the women. Now, um, while that will have happened at different occasions in our deep past, it doesn't actually consolidate itself into domination of women until other factors come into play. And in particular, the other factors that seem to be most influential in this are, as Chris mentioned uh, in passing, storage. Uh, the, uh, the, so we, we evolved in relatively mild seasonal conditions in Africa so that there weren't periods of great hunger 
where storage was necessary in order to survive. However, as human beings started to move into more extreme environments or ex experience more extreme seasonality, so emerged opportunities for brawn, which means you know, uh, physical uh, uh, violence, to dominate over other forms of solidarity. And in the context of storage, once you start to store, you have to decide who will distribute the resources that you have stored, who will protect those resources from theft by other groups of, say, males, because males do tend, not always, of course, but tend to be stronger than females in the human species. Um, and, and so the tendency would have been then for men to start to group together in order to protect those stores. And as they started to protect them, perhaps they could get ideas about how they might control those stores and the access to stores. And once you start to control people's access to vital resources like food, um, then you start to get into the game of power. And once you get into the game of power, then might really does uh, impose itself in, in powerful ways. So we can see not just with, I mean, agriculture consolidated this, of course, because fields and the crops that people were growing needed protection uh, and the stores of grain or whatever food was being produced then needed to be distributed. Uh, so we can see how over time, males managed to consolidate a brawn over this, uh, uh, fem these female coalitions that were so crucial in the emergence of human symbolic culture uh, in its origins. Yeah, I mean, brilliant, Jerome. I mean, this is such a big question and we have in the RAG um, studied it and, and uh, um, it, it's just an enormous question. Let me just say that so many people quite rightly have, have asked questions going right back to Rousseau and, and perhaps earlier about the origin of inequality. How did inequality arise? And in some ways, um, the question is, is what, in order to work that one out, you have to know how on earth it was that we ever gave anything remotely like equality, because primates are not egalitarians. Chimpanzees are not libertarian communists. Far, far, far from it. Uh, so if there was something like an early stage of libertarian or uh, you know, communism, something like the kind of you know, egalitarian system of, of self-organization that Jerome found in the, Cong in the Congo, going right back, we have to explain that first. So I'm, uh, it's, it's absolutely right, we need to ask the second question, but it's difficult to ask, it, difficult to really be, I think, scientific about the collapse of that earlier system if we don't even know what it was and how it got there in the first place. So, I mean, you know, stay around for the, for the rest of the year because it's a, it's a hugely, important, um, hugely important topic, but it's, you know, and it's not even, it's not a separate topic, it's bound up with it, but it's, it's a whole can of worms, of course. Uh, and in RAG, we have had, uh, for a very long time, we've had a specialist, uh, Lionel Sims, whose, whose specialist st study has been um, the Mesolithic and the Neolithic, particularly looking at megalithic monuments like Stonehenge and Avery Stone Circle, which do contain a very powerful record. And I'll simply say one very simple thing, following on from Jerome, um, we, we sort of lost the plot when we lost touch with the moon. Um, when we switch from fidelity to the moon and its rhythms, which hunter-gatherers do, because you can go hunting once a month, uh, and switch to um, following the sun, because you can't, you can't sow the crops and then reap them on a monthly basis. It has to be a seasonal basis. So there's something about um, uh, storage, something about farming, which, which led to this switch from sun to moon. And when the moon was no longer the primary clock, that was a severe blow to women, women, women's, women's bodies, women's physiologies, women's anatomy, women's evolution had placed them in a position to derive enormous power from synchronizing menstrual cycles using the moon as a clock, uh, using the sun as a clock, um, doesn't work. But that's a, that's, a, that's a very long argument, and, I, and you know, I've just made a rather bold statement there, but I think we need another question. <laughs> Any more? There's another on the zoom um and here i'm going to give one to zoom and then come back to you okay w william hello hello hi um i uh thank you all for the talk y you you were talking about how um sort of the ochre record shows you know small spots of ochre and then gradually explodes into sort of periods of, of 
um, where where it became more mainstream, these sort of sex drives. I, I guess I'm mainly curious about what it is from the Oka record, how you make that jump from Oka deposits, or, or if there's something that indicates it, that then suggests that this sort of red Oka picket line, this strike, as in was the Oka being used in this way by the women? Um, and, and yeah, so I'm curious what it is that suggests or indicates that the Oka was being used in this way. Now that's a that's a good one. Um, I think there are two ways of of trying to answer that. What 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 one is strictly sort of abstract in terms of the predictions of the model. You know, it's 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 the predictions are things like when are we first predicting it to occur. When are we predicting it to shift from irregular to regular use? What are our predictions about color selection? Um, and are there any other models that are making other predictions that could be put into competition with it? Um, and the other, the other approach is, is to draw on the ethnographic record and, and to, to see, look at the context in which earth pigments are used and they, they, they marry together very well. I, I mean, the, the, the temporal predictions of the Oka record and the color selection predictions, they certainly are consistent with an ideology of blood. So someone needs to come up with a better ideology of blood to compete with ours. Um, in, in a sense, if you're really going to get to grips with the nature of the archaeological record, and it's going to have to make predictions as to where and when. Uh, on the ethnographic record, I mean, my, what I've mostly focused on is a, a, a Southern African hunter-gatherers, uh, often called the Bushmen. And there, the, the, the one context in which some kind of red substance, be it blood, be it uh, a plant pigment or, or an earth pigment, the one context where it's almost invariably used was in monarchial ritual. That's a girl's first menstruation ritual. It's used in all kinds of other ritual contexts as well, because it's, it's the medium by which people move between worlds. So it's birth, it's death, it's initiation. But, but, but the monarchial rituals are, are the most invariant ritual form among, among the Bushmen. So I think, uh, you know, you have to do both to try and make a convincing argument as to why this is the best interpretation we have for the Oka record. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, uh, just to highlight that next week, we're gonna hear more from Ian regarding with a presentation on the Oka record and saying something about why he believes it, it exemplifies a, the, the earliest ritual tradition of, of humanity, um, alongside the artist Anne Golifer, who is currently working, um, working in Botswana with earth pigments and working in, in collaboration with Motswe uh, Nkwemabala, who is a Herero healer and, and Oka artist. Um, so this may kind of bring together aspects of the ancient usage of ochre with um, quite modern day, but also historic uses of ochre. So we may be able to expand on that question some more next week, if you are able to join us. Um, I'm going to be calling, look, Chris, what are, you, are you gonna read? So you're gonna do, uh, Chris is gonna do a reading. Well, there was one more question. Did Chris Gray want to speak? Well, yeah. Primoz's question. Primoz's question. Okay. But, uh, what I understood him to be asking was is there evidence of a modern female led coalition going on as we speak? And uh, I discovered a book which was called How Iceland Changed the World. Oh, yeah. uh, that famous. Yeah, 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 <laughs> which yeah. talks about the biggest election of the Dishinbuka doctor. As the president of Iceland, yeah, 
I, I would I would suggest people could read that. This is a mm -hmm. fascinating book. Yeah, and a fantastic wonderful. Icelandic sex the, strike. The, the women's women's day off. Women's day off, they called it. Yeah. It was a, it was a it was. day off from everything. And they, okay. it, was, it did include sex. Of course, women so powerful in the, in the fish processing industry. Let, and it mm. changed Iceland. Yeah, it did. It really to this did. day yeah. that they virtually have a, a balanced parliament. Um, but I, I would highlight on that a talk that I'm due to give later in the term, November the 2nd, which is on African women's traditions, customary traditions of rebellion. Um, Iceland's a foremost example for European women, but of course, these tactics are found all over the world. Not, you know, Europe's really lagging. And um, African women have profound traditions of collectivity and, and solidarity. I think Chris is going to end off for us with a little reading, and then we'll sign off for today. Oh, um, oh who's, uh, we've got, okay, can, have we got time for one more Just question? About, What's our time? Two minutes, very quick. Okay, Tommy, we, we'll take your question quickly. Hello? Hi. 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 Um, can you hear me? Sound good? Yes. So, um, my question is about how, um, as a human male myself, I know that my desire for sex isn't motivated by re reproduction. And in fact, I don't really want to have children. Um, so how does that play into women withholding sex at the time of which they're... Right. Um... It, uh, yeah, but you still, <laughs> this is a very basic question on evolution and mechanisms or functions. Um, for, if you're a heterosexual human male, you'll still be very interested in having sex. And that's yeah. body's clever way of tricking you to go and reproduce, even if you don't want to, because your head says, no, not a good time. Your body is tricking you to go and have sex even despite yourself. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a question of evolutionary biology and what are the mechanisms of underlying behavior, um, even if they don't necessarily have a, a f function of actually reproducing. Yeah. Does that make sense at this point? Yeah, I mean, it's just a very, very basic thing. And um, it's, uh, uh, people often say about self-esteem Darwinism, they just say, well, you're assuming people do things to, in order to reproduce. And of course, we. We don't. The fact is, your your body knows how to get um, genes into the future, and your body knows things. And may, your body, you know, anyone that's got a body, and we all got bodies of one sort or another, they're designed um, for the future, if you like. The, the the genes that make your body, they design the body so that there are more genes of that that type in the future. It's an extremely basic question, and I I, I don't know. Can we just leave it there? Um, it's uh, yeah, that's fine. Yes. <laughs> thank you thank you very much right well what i wanted to do um is um just read out another little passage i read out the the, the myths uh, of the seven sisters early on and here is um an, a, a passage not so much about sort of a particular myth but um one of the points i make in the book is that the uh, the, the the main form of what's of like divinity across aboriginal australia is um, a serpent. It, it's often called the rainbow snake. And my argument is that the rainbow snake is not um, a myth, it's not a thing. It was something which was real in the past and to some extent remained real when Europeans arrived in Australia and started discovering things about the, the indigenous people of Australia. And that real thing is ritualized synchronization of menstrual cycles. Just think about it. If women are synchronizing their cycles, then their flows are connecting. And the connecting flows um, you know, are you know, very powerful and sort of magical. And when Europeans first arrived in Australia, they began to realize that something that they had a kind of divinity, which wasn't a sky god. It wasn't a sort of transparent god issuing commands from up in heaven. This was a a different kind of divinity, which seemed to be earthly and, and, and bound up with these um, cycles. So I'm arguing that the rainbow snake is actually 
familiar to all of us in our, from our fairy tales in the form of the dragon. And you find that, you know, in fairy tales, you find St. George and the dragon, you have a patriarch um, and he's got his sword and he wants to uh, have a maiden. And the maiden is in the grip of this serpent, this dragon, and he needs to cut the heads off the dragon and rescue the maiden from the serpent. And in my book, I'm arguing that actually <laughs> what's going on here is the rise of patriarchy needed to chop up this form of solidarity, which the whole book is about. And so the rainbow snake isn't just a mythical creature. It just is the fact that in the past, um, women were able to synchronize their cycles with the tides, with the, with the monsoon floods, with the waxing and waning moon, with the seasons. And so the whole landscape, including the animals and the humans and the tides, had a pulse. Um, and that pulse was, if you like, the spirit. That pulse was um, the magic. So um, uh, let me just read this out. And I'm, I'm referring to the songs from, particularly songs from Northeast Arnhem Land. In such coastal songs, the connection between menstrual blood and monsoonal rain is conceptualized through images in which the blood pours down from women's vaginas into each major vagina place of the land itself, the life-giving waterholes, streams, and inlets on which fertility depends, and flows thence into the sea and into the clouds that rise from the sea, returning later transformed in the shape of the dark monsoonal storms and floods which swallow up the earth. In this scheme of things, human and natural cycles of renewal are mutually supportive and sustainable through the same rites. The skies and the landscape are felt to beat to human rhythms. Everything natural, in other words, is conceptualized in human terms, just as everything human is thought to be governed by natural rhythms. Physiographic features of the countryside, as the anthropologist I'm, I'm following here, Ronald Burnt, Physiographic features of the countryside, as Byrne puts it, were traditionally, quote, likened to male and female genitals, so that imprints in rock told of a mythic act of coitus, a sacred waterhole was a vagina, a shining white substance on a rock surface seemed like semen. Burnt phrases this in his own way by commenting that the Aboriginal intellectual, quote, projected his own belief system onto the environment in which he lived. He saw within it the same forces operating as he identified within his own process of living." End of quote. And I'm now saying, but projection is perhaps an inadequate term. If synchrony of the kind this book has described was at one time central to Aboriginal life, it would seem that rhythmic nature was projecting her logic into a listening human culture as much as the other way round. There seems no reason to discount the Aboriginal's own belief that in their rituals, they were drawing upon natural rhythms and harmonizing with them to the advantage of their relationship with the world around them. It was not that man was dominating nature, but neither was it that human society stood helpless in the face of nature's powers. Rather, human society was flexible enough and sensitive enough to attune itself finally to the rhythms of surrounding life avoiding helplessness by replicating internally nature's own dance. Nature was thereby humanized while humanity yielded to this nature. If the hills felt like women's breasts, if rocks felt like testicles, if the sunlight seemed like sexual fire and the rains felt like menstrual floods, then this was not mere projection of a belief system onto the external world, this was how things felt because given synchrony and therefore a shared life pulse, this was at a deep level how they were. Fantastic. Well, th thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I can't recommend too much if you've never been able to get hold of this book. Um, do we have got copies or we will have copies? They've already been day. snapped up. Some rich have got it. Two of them. Somebody's that. bought, bought our week. supply. There will I, be more to yeah, buy because I, Chris has them available at a cheaper cost than if okay. you look online, it's going to be upwards it's, of 50. It's, it's 50 pounds online. Um, I get a 40% uh, discount. Worth um, cribbing that you can 
get it free on Libcom. You can, if you search blood relations Libcom, you can find a PDF up there. There's somebody very cleverly, some anarchist very cleverly installed. Um, so you can read it that way. Um, but it's an educa it's a lifetime's education in that book uh, because it's the wisdom of a lifetime and the collection of huge array of indigenous cultural wisdom. Um, so, okay, so thank you very much for everybody here who's come today. Really pleased to see you. I hope you'll come back for more next week because next week should be quite a special occasion actually with Anne Golifer, who's a very noted artist um, and here she'll have a lot to say about her work. Um, and thank you to the Zoom community, Jerome and Denise and um, Mark and everybody who's given out their questions. Um, and thank you so much for your participation. Um, um, what else, just, just to remind you, please make sure you've left your details that I know you're here, that you've noted our emails. If you need to tell us, hope not, that you've tested positive so that we can follow up and track and trace. Um, but don't, don't, that's why we're asking for your details. Thank you very much. Um, there is a pub, which is the, the Summers Town Coffee House that we, we went to last week. Um, I know Ian and Kevin, you know the way. So anybody who'd like to go to the pub, the Ian and about Kevin, the pub is you can drink outdoors. we can drink outdoors if the rain isn't if pouring rain down. Is it? Sorry to the Zoom community, you can't come to the pub. <laughs> Maybe one of these days you'll make it. Um, have we finished recording, Chris? Is it recording? Yes. No, I haven't. Oh, you did record. Off. Right. So we're going to say goodbye to you guys, and we're going to go and have a drink. Bye bye. <laughs> that end. So. Right. I'm ending. End the main talk. <laughs>